Amen. Good to see you here this morning. Boy, full house on a, on a cold day. I know we have folks looking for seats. We have seats down front. Nobody wants to sit down front. I get that. But uh, uh, hey, that's a reason to come early. If you want to sit in the back, you got you to gotta come early. Um, I guess that's not the best reason to come early, but uh, it's been a... Um, It's been a difficult week for us this week. By the way, just a couple of things. Um, Amy's doing fantastic. I don't know if you saw Amy's post on Facebook this morning. On Facebook, she simply, a little paragraph that said, I worshiped with my African brothers and sisters in church this morning, so soothing to my soul. She said, Jesus is walking with me. Sometimes he has to carry me but he's walking with me. And she asked prayer. She still has just a little bit of problems with her paperwork before they're able to leave. And so please keep uh, Amy and the kids in prayer. The uh, memorial service is going to be here on Saturday, February 6th at one o'clock. And I would ask you as a church to begin praying for that. We will absolutely pack this place out. There will be people here from all over the country. We'll probably be streaming it live. Uh, around the country, and so please pray, not only for all of the logistics that uh, need to take place, but uh, we want to accomplish three things in that service. First of all, we want to honor God. Secondly, we want to remember Mike. And thirdly, we want to clearly articulate and explain the gospel. And so please be praying about that. The third thing I'd mention is that we have established a memorial fund for, for Amy and the family. Uh, you can simply go to MikeRitteringMemorialFund.com. 100% of everything that comes in is going to Amy and, and the ministry, however she decides to use that. You also can give through the church if you would like to do that. And so if you can just put on your giving envelope, if some of you did today, uh, for Mike Rittering or Amy Rittering, and we'll make sure that you do that. I would encourage you to be faithful in your giving. We're going to have a lot of expenses as all of this takes place to be able to host this, and so please be faithful, but, but um, I would encourage you to, uh, as God lays it on your heart, to give to Amy. There's been an outpouring all around the country from her, for her. But uh, throughout this week, as we have um, experienced grief, um, as we've received uh, condolences from literally uh, around the world, this morning I received a note from a church in Australia that said, uh, we just want you to know we're praying for you and praying for the Rittering family. And as, as we've seen the, uh, the press coverage of Mike, I'm just amazed at how his story has been broadcast, not only locally, but Mike's story has been broadcast around the country and around the world. Um, I've been continually reminded of what God can do through a, a life that is truly flipped for his honor and for his glory. I've been reminded what God can do through the life of someone who says, okay, God, I'm all in. 100%, I'm all in. This week, the influence of Mike's life and ministry has increased exponentially. Uh, The last few days, there's been a video that we didn't even post. Someone else found it on our website of a message that Mike preached here on April 27th, 2014. If you haven't seen that, you need to see that video. We'll probably be doing a little clip of it during the uh, memorial service. But but that, that, that little clip, Mike's sermon, as of this morning, had been viewed 87,000 times. So as I sit back and like you trying to make sense of this, I'm sitting back saying, okay, God, take this tragedy, take Mike's life and take the tragedy of his death and somehow use it exponentially to uh, shake our community, to shake our world with the gospel. And I am fully convinced, God and I have had a lot of conversations this last week, and I I am fully convinced that God is going to raise up an army of believers, an army of warriors, an army of missionaries as a result of Mike's life and death that are going to impact our city, our country, and our world. But here's the truth I want you to grasp today. Okay, please grasp this. Just as God changed Mike's life, 
He can change yours. Just as God took Mike's life, and Mike would tell you, he, was, he, he had some rough points in his life, if you've heard his testimony. And, and when Mike gave his life to Jesus Christ, there, there was a flip that was taking place. There was a 180-degree turn. And God got a hold of his life, and God changed his life. And just as God changed Mike, God can change me, and God can change you. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Will you let God flip you? Will you let God turn you upside down for Jesus Christ? Two weeks ago, we began a series that we've just called Flipped, all right? A series on the Sermon on the Mount. And by the way, kudos to Pastor Brad, who did a great job two weeks ago as he stood and he, and he took the words of Jesus and he, he proclaimed the words of Jesus in a powerful way. Well, today we begin to dissect Jesus' sermon so, so that we can apply those truths to our personal lives. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to look at one verse uh, I joked with Brad two weeks ago, he memorized his entire text, and I want you to know I've memorized my entire text today, all right? So, so Brad has nothing on me. I memorized Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. <laughs> Matthew 5 and verse 3, Jesus said this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Would you read that with me today? Let's read it today. Ready? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Pray with me today. Lord, help us. Holy Spirit of God, help us to understand what this means. We're so guilty at times of reading over Scripture and not truly understanding it, not truly comprehending it as a result, not applying it to our lives. So today we ask that you, the great teacher, would teach us this morning. Help us not only to understand what it means to be poor in spirit, but help us to be poor in spirit. Help us to exemplify that in our lives. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verses 3 through 12, and we're going to be dissecting these the next few weeks. Verses 3 through 12 uh, are a part of the sermon that, that, are, that is simply known as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes is a word that's, that's not common for us. Some people have tried to explain it and just say that they're attitudes that we should be. That's not the exact root in the meaning of the word, but I guess it's a pretty practical application. And so uh, this morning, let me just take just a few, a few moments and, uh, and explain what the Beatitudes are and how they apply to us. They're in your notes, and I'm going to race through this part. The first thing is this. The Beatitudes are a series of conditional blessings that give true happiness to citizens of the kingdom of God. And so these are conditional blessings. Jesus is saying, if you do this, then this is the blessing that you're going to receive. And if you respond in this way, then this is the blessing that you can expect. As you read through, the Beatitudes are paradoxical. That's just a long word that means that their conditions and corresponding blessings do not seem to match. You see someone who is suffering, and God says, blessed is this person who is suffering because they are going to be extremely blessed. And sometimes we have this erroneous concept in our mind that the blessing means that God is going to exempt me from suffering. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Blessed are those that suffer, that mourn, that are even persecuted because they will be blessed by me. In our minds, that seemingly doesn't make sense. The word blessed has the idea of an inward happiness. As a matter of fact, if you have a modern translation, it might say, your translation might say, happy are those. That's not a bad translation because the word blessed speaks of an inward happiness that is not affected by outward circumstances. 
the, the truth being that, that as believers, as citizens of the kingdom, we can be internally happy regardless of what is taking place in our life. Our circumstances do not, must not affect our happiness. Now, we have a tendency to believe that happiness is based upon our circumstances. If I'm healthy, I'm happy. If I got money, I'm happy. If I got a good car, I'm happy. If I have this, I'm happy. That simply is not the case. True happiness, true joy, true happiness, real joy is exempt from the trials, tribulations, and problems of life. In other words, what I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter whether you're going through those trials and tribulations. You still can experience true happiness. You can be poor in spirit. You can be mourning, as many of us are today. We can be hungry. We can be even persecuted and still experience true happiness. And that led me to make this statement that the things of this world do not produce real happiness. Now, now, I'm not sure we're convinced of that. In our minds, we comprehend it, but I'm sure we're not convinced of it. The things of this world do not produce real happiness. Real happiness comes from seeking first the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, towards the end of this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes this statement in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, <coughs> he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when you seek his kingdom, his righteousness, then all of these other things will be added to you. We have a tendency to seek those things first. So, so as I mentioned, in the Beatitudes, Jesus gives a series of conditional blessings. And the first conditional blessing that Jesus gives simply says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So if you're like me, I read that, and there's a question that comes to my mind immediately. The question being this, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? All right, so I just want to take just a second and, and, and flesh that out. And then we'll talk about how to make that a reality in our lives. So if you're following along in your notes, all right, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, first of all, it does not refer to material poverty. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not saying, and your translation might say this because some translations say it. Your translation might say, blessed are the poor. That is not what Jesus is saying in the passage. He is not saying that you must be poor in order to be happy or that you must be poor to enter the kingdom of God. That is not what Jesus is saying in the passage. Let's kind of flesh that out for a second because being poor doesn't make you more spiritual and being wealthy doesn't make you more carnal. All right? Let, let that sink into your mind and heart. Being poor doesn't make you more spiritual. Jesus is not saying, man, the poor people are the most spiritual ones and the wealthy people are the most carnal ones. That is not what Jesus is saying in the passage. I've met plenty of wealthy people that truly love and follow the Lord. Likewise, I've met plenty of poor people who live their lives as if God does not exist. Poverty does not equate with spirituality. Now, having said that, though, let me just make a little statement. Having said that, we need to realize that wealth does have a tendency to distract us from God. The more toys that we have, the more ability we have to travel, the more experiences that we're able to experience, if we're not careful, those things can pull us away from God. They can distract us from our relationship with God. That's why Jesus makes the statement in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 24, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because if we have much, those things seem to distract us and pull us away from God. But Jesus is not saying in the passage, blessed are those who are materially poor. Secondly, uh, uh, spiritual poverty does not refer to weakness or lack of vitality. 
Jesus is not speaking of those who, who don't have a lot of energy. He's not speaking of the weak. He's not speaking of the sickly. It's easy for us to associate spiritual poverty with physical weakness, but that's not what Jesus is saying. Now, admittedly, physical weakness at times emphasizes our mortality. And when we become physically weak, it may drive us to God. But the weak are no more blessed by God than the strong. The third thing I said is this, it does not refer to false modesty. Being poor in spirit doesn't refer to false modesty. You know what I'm talking about. We've all done it at times. Some of us are probably a little bit more guilty of it than others, and I have to confess I'm guilty of this sometimes as well. We love compliments. We just act like we don't love compliments. Someone gives us a compliment and we're like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. But inside we're saying, bring it on, yeah. And we ask a couple of really humble questions so that they might say something else about us. And then, you know, we kind of, oh, shucks, she shouldn't say that about me. You know, that kind of mentality, all right? Um, we complain about the attention we receive as if it was a burden, I have to admit, I've kind of done that a little bit this week, and I've been guilty of that, and I was convicted about that as I was, as I was studying through this, because we've had plenty of opportunities to, to speak with reporters, and at times I've found myself telling people, oh yeah, it's been a really rough week, I have to do another interview with a reporter later today, please pray for me. I mean, that's false humility, that's false modesty. If we're not careful, we, we emphasize that. We use prayer requests as a means to communicate things we want others to know. Do we not? You know, please pray for me because I have a meeting with the mayor this week. All right? I mean, we really don't want prayer. We just want people to know we have a meeting with the mayor, you know? I mean, you know, please pray for me. I think I'm about to get a really big bonus because I'm like employee of the week. I really need your prayers. You know, if we're not careful, we do that. And we have this false modesty that we demonstrate and we disguise it in prayer requests. Or we spend more time talking about ourselves than we do talking about Jesus. I love the words of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. All right, so, so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's not talking about those who are materially poor, all right? He, he's not talking about those who are weak or anemic or lack vitality. He's not speaking of false modesty, false humility that, that we tend to uh, demonstrate on a regular basis. What is Jesus talking about? He's speaking of true humility, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's talking about those who are truly humble. Now, now here's where I want us to pause for a second. I want us to put our, our, our Bible thinking caps on and our theological thinking caps on because I want to explain what that really means. What does it mean to be truly humble? What does it mean to be truly poor in spirit? And I would be the very first to stand up and say that I am not the best person to be talking about this. My mom used to say all the time, we don't have a problem with pride in our family because Brian has it all, all right? And so if my mom was sitting on the front row and she knew I was speaking on humility, she'd be giggling the entire time, all right? And, and Vicky probably is too, I'm not sure. Please don't, please don't giggle so they see you at least, Vicky, all right? So what, is, what, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean to be truly humble? Where the word that Jesus uses literally means to crouch or to cower. That's what the word means, the actual definition of the word. It, it, it speaks of someone who is in abject poverty, someone who is totally dependent upon someone else to meet their needs. Now remember, he's not talking about financial things. He's not talking about material things. He's talking about spiritual things. And he's talking about someone who is totally, completely, spiritually poor. 
Dallas Willard, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, translates this verse this way. I love this. I didn't put it up on the screen. Listen. Dallas Willard says this. Blessed are the spiritual zeros. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, the deprived, and the destitute. We have a tendency to try to elevate our spirituality. And Jesus is saying Blessed are those who recognize and admit their true condition before God. Let me give you two things. I kind of work that out with two phrases in your outlines. You say, Brian, okay, talk to me a little bit more. What does that mean? Well, true humility comes from an understanding of our total depravity. True humility comes from a, from a complete understanding and acceptance, a, a recognition of our total depravity. Depravity is a, is a big word that simply means that without Jesus, without God in our lives, we are totally depraved. Without God, we are degenerate. Without God, we are immoral. Without God, we are corrupt. Without God, we are evil. Without God, we are wicked. Here's what it means. There is nothing innately good within us. Now that goes against secular humanism. That goes against what you and I hear on television today. But, 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 but it's important for us to realize that without God, we are nothing. We need God in our lives. The Bible says it's so much better than I can. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah says, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Here's what Isaiah is saying. All the good things we do, we go to church, we we give, we sacrifice, we help our neighbors. All of those good things that we do that in our minds make us seem good in God's eyes are just like a polluted garment. We can never be good enough. There there is nothing within Brian, there is nothing within you that in and of ourselves pleases God. We're sinners. Now now, now listen, I'm not saying without or with God we're we're terrible. Let's get to the end of the story, okay? Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand that? Whose heart is he talking about? Mine? (laughs) Mine? Whose heart is he talking about? Yours. Our heart is desperately wicked. Hey, I had my uh, two-year-old granddaughter here this week for, for, for a day. By the way, isn't she fantastic if you've seen her online? Absolutely. If you, if you want to see pictures of her, you can you know, like me on Facebook, and, and I'll, I'll bore you to death with pictures of her. By the way, we just found out, I prophesied it a couple of weeks ago, we just found out, I'm allowed to say that Justin and Jenny are expecting again, and we're going to be grandparents again in July. All right? I don't know how in the world I worked that into the message, but I did. Okay, so, so my two-year-old innocent granddaughter is with us this week. All right? Guess what? She's already has this rebellious streak in her. I mean, already. Isabella, come here and put your toys away. No! No! I'm not going to do that. Come here, Isabella. Come up and sit on this chair. We're going to eat. No! No! I don't want to do that. Now, now, Justin's not teaching her how to do that. Jenny's not teaching her how to do that. That's just Isabella's sinful nature that's coming out and as beautiful and as gorgeous and as wonderful as Isabella is. She's a sinner in the sight of God. Just as you are, we are depraved. Romans chapter three, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now even though 
many people readily admit that they're sinners. They struggle. We struggle to admit that what we do is really bad. I'm a sinner, but, (laughs) Brian, there's a lot of people that are worse than me. I, I know I commit some sins, but my sins aren't near as bad as that guy that lives next door or that guy in church right across the aisle, all right? Certainly, God looks at us different. He sees that guy for all of his weaknesses, and he realizes that I am not as bad as that person or that lady. We excuse our sins. We justify our rebellions. We compare ourselves with one another instead of comparing ourselves with God. Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives a parable of two men who went into the temple, one who trusted in his own righteousness and one who didn't. Jesus talks about the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee, you can read it in Luke chapter 18. I'm not sure whether we put it up on the screen. In Luke chapter 18, the Pharisee comes into church and looks around and says, man, God, I'm so grateful that I'm not like a lot of people that are in here. I'm, I'm pretty faithful in church. I, I give tithes of, of everything that I make. I'm not a terrible guy. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not a terrible guy. But the tax collector standing afar off wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the second one, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's what Jesus is saying. To be poor in spirit, true humility means that we understand our total depravity. Here's the second thing, and i got to go quick. True humility comes from an understanding of our total dependence upon God. The fact that we are totally dependent upon him, to say it simply, to be poor in spirit means that I recognize that I cannot do anything without God. I desperately need Jesus in my life. True spiritual poverty eliminates any sense of spiritual independence, any sense of self-confidence, any sense of autosufficiency. Here's a couple of verses, Psalm 73, 26. My strength and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, and God is my portion forever. John chapter 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears Bears much fruit from apart for apart from me, you can't do anything. Not my words, Jesus' words. Say it with me today. Apart from God, I can't do anything. Would you say it with me? Apart from God, I can't do anything. Say it again. Apart from God, I can't do anything. You see, you'll never be truly happy. You will never be spiritually blessed. You will never inherit the kingdom of God, as Jesus says in these verses, until that truth becomes a reality in your life. You and I need God in every area of our life. You cannot grow in your faith without Jesus. You cannot understand and apply the Bible without Jesus. You cannot overcome temptation without Jesus. Husbands, you cannot love your wives without Jesus. Wives, you cannot put up with your husbands without Jesus. Parents, you cannot raise children that honor God and will serve God without Jesus. Volunteers, you cannot serve correctly without Jesus. You need Jesus. And I need Jesus. We sang that song just a few moments ago. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to you. You see, our problem is we don't believe that. 
We really don't. In our heart of hearts, we think we can do it on our own. You say, Brian, how do you know that? You're judging me. Because if you believe that, you would spend so much time in prayer crying out to God and telling him how much you needed him. And listen, I'm not pointing at you. If I believe that, I would spend so much time in prayer saying, God, I cannot make it without you. These are the words of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand their spiritual condition. Blessed are those who understand that they need God. Why? For they will inherit the kingdom of God. For theirs is the kingdom of God. I think it's so significant that this is the first one of the Beatitudes. This is where it starts. You and I must be poor in spirit. My time's up. Indulge me for just a few moments. Okay, so we looked at what does it mean to be poor in spirit. Let me answer this question today. How do you become poor in spirit? All right, how do I become? Do we find it on Amazon? Oh, my word, there's poor in spirit. It's on sale today, free shipping, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it. How do, how, how do we become poor in spirit? Let me give you three things, all right? Please catch these. They're practical. Please catch these. Number one, you must take your eyes off of yourself and put them on Jesus. I must take my eyes off of myself and put them on Jesus. Man, that's so tough. In the age of camera phones, selfie sticks, and Instagram, is it not? Our culture tells us it's all about self-promotion. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat are all wonderful tools for self-glorification. I get it. I'm guilty. I got a Facebook account, all right? I mean, if we're not careful, we make life about who? About us. It's about me. I want everybody to see how good I look today. Why, here's my selfie stick. Don't you like this outfit? All right, I'm heading to work. All right, we make it about what? We make it about us. Hey, hey, I'm not saying it's wrong. All right, this is my son Mark's. It's not mine. I don't have a house off the stick. All right? I'm throwing Mark under the bus. This is Mark's, all right? <laughs> I'm not saying Facebook, all right? The phone's mine. The selfie stick is Mark's, all right? I'm not saying go out and close your Facebook account. I'm not saying give away your selfie stick. That's not what I'm saying today, but I am saying this. Please catch this. Please catch this. If we spent more time looking at Jesus than we do looking at ourselves. We would be more like him and less like us. If we spent more time looking at Jesus than we do ourselves, we would be more like him and less like us. Why am I so much like me and so much not like God? Because I spend more time looking at me than I do looking at him. See, in order to be poor in spirit, we've got to take our eyes off of ourselves. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The NASB and the, and the NIV say fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the New Living Translation says keeping our eyes on Jesus. I wish I had time to dissect that word because that word looking is a very interesting word. It not only means to look at something, but it means to look away from everything else. In other words, I don't allow anything to distract me. I keep my eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone. (laughs) Hey, we're so guilty of having wandering eyes. It's like the husband who's out on the date with his wife and he's looking at other women. All right, we wouldn't do that. And yet in our spiritual relationship with God, we're looking at God, but we're constantly looking around to see if there's anything else more attractive, more interesting, something that would grab our attention more than God at this moment. And we take our eyes off of 
Jesus. As believers, we have a tendency to have wandering eyes. We look to Jesus, but we're easily distracted. True poverty of spirit is achieved when we take our eyes off of ourselves and we fix them firmly on Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing. You must starve the flesh. In order to be poor in spirit, you must starve the flesh. Hey, the simple truth is this. If you feed something, it will grow. All right? I'm a living example of that this morning, all right? I went to the cardiologist, true story. I was at the cardiologist the other day. You know, they always have you weigh right when you go in. You know, I hate that. You know, so they have you weigh. So finally, the cardiologist comes in. He looks at my chart with my weight, kind of looks over at me, looks at the chart with my weight, looks over at me and says, so what happened, Brian? (laughs) Basically, I said, It was the holidays, all right? I overeat during the holidays, all right? Okay, here's the idea, all right? If you feed something, it will grow. You have a sinful nature inside of you that is constantly yelling, feed me, feed me. You have the sinful nature that wants to be fed. And if I feed it, if you feed it, it will grow. But through God's help, we can starve it. Through God's help, we can weaken those desires and eventually defeat them. Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Say, Brian, how do I starve the spirit? Let me just give you some practical things, okay? Hold with me. I promise I'm almost done, all right? Uh, Let me just give you really practical. I might step on your toes, but I stepped on mine, all right? Don't watch movies or television shows that show sexual scenes. You said, man, what are you talking about, Brian? You eliminate a lot of movies. Or you want to feed your flesh, or do you want to starve your flesh? Hey, guys, let's just be honest. You know what happens when you watch that. All right, let's not act like we're super spiritual. I can watch that, and it doesn't bother me at all. Fooey, you can. You know you can't, and you know I can't. All right, don't feed the flesh. Don't listen to songs that talk about things that dishonor God. Put a filter on your Internet so that you don't look at things that distract you. Don't spend time salivating over technical gadgets that you just cannot afford. But you spend all of your time and your mind is wrapped up in that. Guys, learn to bounce your eyes when you're out in public so you don't look at a woman who is dressed inappropriately. Hey, here's what happened. Learn to feed the spirits. You feed the spirit by spending time in the word of God. Learn to feed the spirit and starve the flesh. I was thinking, that'd be a great screensaver on your phone or your computer. Feed the spirit, starve the flesh. To be reminded of that. Feed the spirit, starve the flesh. Feed the spirit, starve the flesh. Galatians 5.24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its lusts. In other words, I am not going to expose myself to something that is going to make me think or act in a way that does not glorify God. Why am I going to feed this monster within me? I want to starve it. Because the more I starve the flesh and the more I feed on spiritual things, the more I become like Jesus. Here's the last thing you must ask in faith. How do we have, how do we become poor in spirit? We must ask. Ask God for it. The last few days I've been praying, God help me to be poor in spirit. God, help me to demonstrate that in my life. It doesn't come natural to me. It's not something I can just decide to do and begin to do it. I can only do it as you enable me to do it. God, help me to be poor in spirit. You see, here's what Jesus says. Not Brian's words, Jesus' words. Blessed 
are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As much as I would have loved to him to say, blessed are those who attend church every single Sunday, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say that. As much as I would love for him to say, blessed are those who give sacrificially, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say that. He said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who understand their true condition, who understand their need of God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hey, God's all about his kingdom. We live in a kingdom that is different than his kingdom, but God's all about his kingdom. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As believers, we have the privilege of living here, but being citizens of the kingdom. But it all begins with being poor in spirit. Thank you.